Hi, I'm Chris Christie Taylor, your host for the Newton Conservators Environmental Show. Today we're beginning a two-part series entitled Living with Wildlife in Newton. It's based on a lecture given last November at the Newton Free Library by Colleen Alfenbuttle from the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. In recent years, the roster of wild creatures in Newton has expanded from beyond the usual gray squirrels, and chipmunks, rabbits, raccoons, and skunks. It now includes some newcomers, including foxes, fisher, bobcat, wild turkeys, and even coyotes. There's also been a considerable increase in the white-tailed deer and the Canada geese within the city. Colleen will explain why these changes have occurred, and she'll provide us a description of each of these new species here in Newton. In this first session, to tell about the kind of habitat they need as well as give some information about their life histories. In the second show, she'll provide information about how we all can share the pleasures of their company here in the city with mutual respect for each other's territory and needs. Thank you very much. I have a feeling here there's two camps of people that one, they just want to hear more about wildlife. You really like hearing about wildlife, you like watching shows about it, and you're, and you're just taking this opportunity to learn as much as you can. And then there's probably quite a few of you that you see the wildlife all the time, it's in your backyard, and you're wondering, what can I do to deal with this? Is this natural? Is this unnatural? Should I be concerned? Or can I live with this? So the focus of my talk is mainly, it, it was kind of hard to put together because Luckily, we do have so many wildlife species that have learned to adapt to our changing environment. And while there's many species that are still threatened, still endangered, we're having many species in Massachusetts that were once extirpated. You know, by the 1800s, they were gone out of Massachusetts. And now we're seeing these populations have not only recovered, but they're at, they're at healthy population levels. And so it's kind of exciting for us, but we realize the negative part is that we also have a lot of people. So we're having a lot of encounters and we're trying to find that balance between taking, you know, you know, health, you know, human health safety matters into consideration when we're dealing with managing wildlife. One thing, when I started in wildlife over a decade ago, you know, I thought I would be out west, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, you know, monitoring wildlife. That's where the wildlife was, that's where I wanted to be. He asked me 10 years ago if I would be in the New England states talking town just on the border of Boston about how they should deal with coyotes or fishers. I would have said, no way. You know, that's not where the wildlife is. It's, it's out west. It's out in the woods. And I have a feeling probably some of you feel the same way. You never thought you'd be seeing fishers in your backyard or a coyote walking down the street. So I think both of us, both sides, we're kind of surprised at what the wildlife has been doing and how they've adapted. So now we're both, I think, learning what we can do to live with each other. I'm going to talk about living with wildlife. And before I start to go into some of the wildlife you have in your neighborhoods and how to deal with them, I kind of want to first talk about the division of fisheries and wildlife, kind of explain our history and what our responsibilities are. Um, so first, we were founded back in 1866, and we were originally a fish commission. And we were created because the public was concerned about the decline of the Atlantic salmon and about pollution in the waterways. So since 1866, we've increased our responsibilities from not only fisheries, but we've created four other sections in our organization. So of course, first we have the fisheries section. Uh, one of the responsibilities is still to try to restore the Atlantic salmon in our waterways. And they also do a lot of other research on native fishes. We have the wildlife section, and that's the section I'm in. We mainly deal with game animals. And when I talk about game animals, these are all animals that you can hunt or trap. We have a natural heritage and endangered species section. And right now in Massachusetts, we have 190 vertebrates and invertebrates that are listed as threatened or endangered. Um, so this section is responsible for trying to do a lot of research to try to figure out how we can restore these populations. Our information and education section 
they kind of focus more on giving public talks. They focus on giving educational programs, including we have a Becoming an Outdoors Woman series, kind of focused on women, trying to bring women more into the outdoors. And this section is also responsible for the literature that you're able to collect in the back. They create literature for the public, so the public not only ha you know, can hear us talk, but can take it home with them and read more about it. And we also have this magazine, which it's produced quarterly, and, and it's a great magazine because it really explains what's going on in Massachusetts regarding wildlife, some of the programs we have. Um, our last section, the Realty section, also known as Wildlife Lands, what they've been doing is looking at Massachusetts and trying to key in on critical habitat. You know, what habitat do we need to conserve? You know, trying to focus on creating corridors for wildlife to travel so that the landscape is not so fragmented. Due to the cost of realty in Massachusetts, they've started really focusing on getting landowners to enroll in the Conservation Reserve Program. We pay them a certain amount of money to keep their land, to conserve it, there's no future development. So I just want to talk about how the landscape has changed in Massachusetts because it's changed quite a bit and the history of Massachusetts kind of explains why we're in the situation we're in now with all this wildlife in our backyards. And a lot of people think that with the current rate of development we're really seeing the decline in forested lands, but we've already been here. This is kind of the second time around we're going through this. The first time happened back into the 1700s. Massachusetts was just being settled. It was pretty much completely forested. And then, you know, you know, people came in, they started settling the land, and they started clearing it. One, they're clearing it for the wood, but they're also clearing it to make farms. So within about 200 years, we had clear cut almost all of Massachusetts. And this was not only happening in Massachusetts, but every state east of the Mississippi was pretty much clear cut. You know, I worked in Virginia, and where I worked in Virginia, in the western part of Virginia, it's beautiful. Blue Ridge Mountains, forests everywhere. But what people don't realize is when you're looking at these forests, they're not hundreds of years old. They're about 100 years old. It's only recently that these woods have started to regenerate. So the same thing happened in Massachusetts. That happened everywhere else. People had to settle. They had to figure out how to live on the land. And back then, they did it by clearing the woods. So in 1830, we cleared the landscape. If there was unregulated hunting and trapping. We pretty much wiped out almost all the wildlife. We, didn't, we hardly had any deer. We didn't have any bear, didn't have any moose, no fishers, no coyotes, no wolves, hardly had anything. Um, so this is what Massachusetts looked like in 1830. Well, what happened is after 1830, we start to get into the Industrial Revolution. People started to leave their farms to make more money in the cities, to work in factories. Also. Because when they cleared the land, you know, they didn't have fertilizers like we do now. They didn't have the knowledge that we have now. So they pretty much used up the soils on their farms. So within 20 years, their lands were no longer fertile and they had to leave the farmland, either to go out to the Midwest to more fertile lands to create more farms or to the cities again to get jobs. So starting around the 1850s, we had a lot of farm abandonment. And so that basically, once the farms were abandoned, that allowed the forest to kind of regenerate. So, 1850s, the farms are abandoned. You know, that's one reason if you've ever gone hiking out in Massachusetts and coming along a random rock wall, that's what you're seeing is you're actually walking through an old farmland. We started to see the regeneration occur, and then about 1930s, that's when the hardwood started to recover. And starting in the 1930s is also when we start to see wildlife start to come back into Massachusetts. We start to see beaver come in. I think 1928 was the first time beaver was documented since they were pretty much extirpated in the 17, late 1700s. We started to see black bears come back. So as the forest came back, so did the animals. So now we're coming to present day Massachusetts. As of a few years ago, 70% of Massachusetts was forested. We had pretty much almost recovered what we had lost during the 17 and 1800s. And the animals followed that recovery. They started to increase their populations. Now we are seeing development. And so while we've seen some of these wildlife populations increase and restore back to natural levels, we've seen their habitats start to decline because of development. So here's a typical Massachusetts landscape. And Looking at this now, this is, this is still not good habitat for certain animals that are really sensitive to human development. But then again, this is ideal habitat for other wildlife that's learned to adapt to being close to us. And in this picture, you see we have kind of a, in the center 
you know, wetland area, water. We have forest edging around it that provides cover for animals. And then we have our housing developments. And the housing developments, because of what we do around our houses, that actually provides a lot of prey for wildlife. Also, just food people leave out, you know, there's a food resource for animals. So this landscape is proving ideal for certain types of wildlife. So here's your typical backyard, you know, in a Massachusetts neighborhood. You know, a person has a cleared backyard, they have a bird feeder because they want to attract birds. They have trees and shrubs around their house. And so again, you know, they want to attract birds, everybody, you know, and it helps the birds, you know, we, we want to help the birds, we want to provide food for them. But what we're also doing is we're attracting a lot of other wildlife in the process. <laughs> this is one. <laughs> I think that most of the black bear population is west of the Connecticut River. But I think we did have a bear about a year ago show up in Westwood. You know, someone saw it. They had police reports. We were called in. By the time we got down there, we couldn't find the bear. And we, we don't know what happened to the bear. No one's reported seeing it since. So he found a good hiding spot. But we do see that bears are slowly coming into neighborhoods. And the main reason is they're attracted to bird feeders, bird feeders and garbage. We're also seeing white-tailed deer becoming a big problem. Again, these deer were almost extirpated from Massachusetts. Now we think they're in higher numbers than they ever were historically. Um, so they're coming in, and the reason they're coming in is because people are either feeding them on purpose or incidentally. And I personally would never do this. I mean, this can be a dangerous animal. I mean, look at the rack on it. That can be very dangerous if the deer decides that it's a little worried about you. So we're seeing that deer are coming back into neighborhoods because neighborhoods provide an ideal situation. One, they have food, either, again, someone's feeding them purposely, or you, know, you have shrubs, you, you, know, you have stuff around your house, landscaping around your house to make it beautiful, but the deer sees it as food. So you get these deer coming in, eating the foliage, you know, damaging people's yards, and at the same time, they're in a neighborhood where there's no hunting, there's no predators, so they're perfectly safe. And that's where they're going to stay. As long as they're getting food, as long as they're protected, they're going to stay there. It's an ideal situation for them. The other animal we're seeing is moose. Moose were once extirpated way back in the 1700s. We got rid of them in Massachusetts. Now with the forest recovering, the moose started to come down from New Hampshire and Vermont. And we believe now we have between five to 700 moose in Massachusetts. Now most of those are in northern Massachusetts, but we've started to see moose come south and come east. And here's an example, and this, is, this was a moose that was in uh, just uh, um, west of here, just showed up in town, and we get these every, a few times every year, just, but it was right downtown. It's, you, normally it's a young you know, moose that you know, it's left mom, it's trying to establish its own home range, it's trying to find a new place to live, and it somehow ends up in town. Um, and a moose, when you think, it's a 700-pound animal. It can be very dangerous. It can, moose can be aggressive if they get confused, if they're not sure of what's going on, just like anything else. You know, when you don't know what's going on, you tend to become more aggressive and more scared of your situation. We're also seeing an increase in vehicle collisions with moose. I think this year alone we've had just over 50. And, you know, white-tailed deer are always a concern, you know, when you hit one with a vehicle. But a moose is definitely a bigger concern. A white-tailed deer is normally 150 pounds and can do a significant amount of damage. A moose colliding with a car, that can be very lethal because it is a 700-pound animal. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to identify areas where we know moose are crossing. And we're trying to, you know, put signs up in those areas, try to notify the public, let them know that this is a spot, hopefully just to make the driver more aware. I don't think we can slow drivers down, but at least make them more aware, hopefully make them more on the lookout when they're driving through an area. Now I'm going to move from these big mammals to these, the smaller mammals. And usually these are some of the smaller mammals you're definitely more familiar with. You know, we have the possum. And we have a skunk, <laughs> and we have raccoons. <laughs> and in this particular dumpster, I think they counted about 50 raccoons in this dumpster. T very unhealthy situation, very unhealthy. And as you can see, these animals, it's not surprising. They're in our neighborhoods because they're attracted to the food we leave out, e again, either purposely or by just leaving the lid open on a dumpster. But the other thing they're attracted to that I think people think of less often 
is crawl spaces underneath your porches, your houses, and your sheds. You know, some of these animals hibernate, some of them don't, but what they all do is when the weather gets bad, we have weather conditions like this, where it's kind of chilly, <coughs> it's really wet, they're going to seek protection just like we would. So they look for warm spots, and a lot of times that warm spot is underneath your house. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, if they start to go underneath your crawl space, they might discover a hole into your basement. And so that's when we really get concerned. So one thing we tell people is, you know, look, look around your house. I mean, the ho hopefully by the end of this talk, when you go home, you know, if you do have a problem with wildlife in your yard, in your house, you know, you can look around your house and see, identify some of the things that an animal might look at. So kind of try to give you the perspective of what the animal's looking for. So in this case, you can kind of obviously see there's crawl space underneath the porch that that raccoon might end up you know, living under for a while when the weather conditions get bad. Or <laughs> other crawl spaces it might take advantage of. Now the other thing besides you know, some foods that we leave out and besides crawl spaces, the other thing that attracts wildlife to our neighborhoods are squirrels. And squirrels are a part of a larger picture of an entire prey base that's available in, sub in suburbia that wildlife will take advantage of. You know, we, we landscape our yards, we have mulch all around our shrubs and bushes. Well, by having that, we're providing habitat for squirrels, chipmunks, rodents, moles, voles. We put out bird feeders and we track small birds. Or we're you know, we have this intense area of prey, you know, these small animals. And so when we have that, what we also have, besides the natural prey base, we have our cats. And wildlife can't tell the difference between a squirrel and someone's pet. You know, they don't recognize the collar you have around. And I personally have two cats of my own, and I keep them inside strictly. I, I will not let them go outside. And it's because, again, wildlife use them as potential prey, because usually they are only 5 to 10 pounds. They're somewhat small. They're smaller than the animal preying on them. And so, therefore, the animal, the wildlife use them as potential food. And one animal, especially one animal that's gotten a lot of attention this past week, is the fisher. Um, and I know the newspapers have been more calling it a fisher cat. That's what it's more well known as. But the fisher is actually part of the weasel family. It's not a cat at all. Um, sometimes it's called a cat because it can climb like a cat. But this is just one example of an animal that we used to think was strictly like in the deep woods. You know, needed a huge amount of area, needed to be away from people, away from disturbed areas. And now we're finding out that it's adapting. It's learned that, you know, it can take advantage of the trees we plant alongside our house. It can take advantage of just little corridors of trees and shrubs for cover. And then what it can do is also focus in on the prey around our house, such as cats, unfortunately, squirrels, chipmunks, and birds. And again, this is an example of habitat we used to think the fisher could only thrive in, and now we're finding that it can be in more open, disturbed areas. And the recent example is the fisher that was discovered down in the Cape Cod just past the canal. That's the first time a fisher has been documented past the canal in Massachusetts history, documented. We always had suspicions, but it's the first time we actually were able to document it. So we're excited. We're like, you know, this is an animal that was once extirpated. You know, it was out of Massachusetts. Not only has it recovered, but it's recovered to the point that's in places we didn't expect. The other animal we're seeing more of is the bobcat. Um, we're more seeing that in western central Massachusetts, but we do get scattered reportings of it in eastern Massachusetts. Uh, and it's more elusive. Typically, when you see the bobcat, it's just going to be a glance. It's just like your own cat. They're elusive. They don't want to be seen. They don't want to be bothered. And so usually you just catch a flash of them. But again, they're attracted to the neighborhoods because of the prey we're providing. Now the, the more interesting animals that gets a lot of attention is the coyote. And again, when I worked out west, you know, I was trapping wolves for two years. And in the process, you know, I'm out in the woods all the time. You know, and, and with coyotes also, you know, coyotes and wolves were out there. I hardly saw coyotes. I think over the two years I was out there spending 24-7 out in the woods every day, I saw coyotes less than five times by chance. Rarely saw them. Out here, you know, out here in Massachusetts, in eastern Massachusetts, I know people that live in Newton that have seen more coyotes than I have. And it's just, it's such a change. It's really changed over the past few years because coyotes are very adaptable animals. They're very smart. 
they can figure things out and they've learned how to adapt with the environment. So I want to kind of get into more detail about the coyote because it is a more higher profile animal. People do see it more often and it does receive a lot more media attention. Some good, some bad. And I just want, kind of want to give you the facts um, to, to kind of dispel some of the uh, you know, rumors that go around when you know, coyotes make the news. So first, a coyote is typically 30 to 40 pounds. You know, we hear people saying they see 80 pound coyotes. It's just, they're, they're not that big. It can be misleading because of the fur they have, but typically they're 30 to 40 pounds. The coyote I have in the back is a typical coyote that we have in Massachusetts. They also come in a variety of colors. They can be blonde, they can be reddish, they can be black, and they can be gray, which causes a problem with identification. Sometimes people see foxes and they think it's a coyote or vice versa. Sometimes they think they, you know, seen a coyote and it's a fox. It just, it really is tricky because of the pelt color that, that it can come in. Now some characteristics of the coyote is, the big one is it is territorial. It's very territorial, which when you see a coyote, like you, the coyotes that you have in Newton, it's probably keeping other coyotes out. A typical home range size for a coyote is anywhere from five to 30 square miles. And the home range is based off how much food it has. The more food it has in a spot, the smaller the home range. But once it settles into an area, that's its territory and it's gonna keep other coyotes out. And the main way it does that is by signaling other coyotes through howling. So I don't know if you've heard coyotes, but when you hear them howling at night, it's doing it for two main reasons. One, it's telling other coyotes that aren't part of its family to stay out. This is my territory, my land. Don't even bother coming in. The other thing coyotes are doing is when they're howling is they're telling their other family members where they are. So we've gotten reports of people saying they hear coyote in one direction than another, and it almost sounds like the coyotes are surrounding them. And you know, they're very you know, intimidated by that. And what those coyotes are doing, for the most part, is telling each other, here I am, where are you? You're over here, okay, I'm over here. And they're kind of telling other family members where they are. So coyote how it's not malicious, it, it, it isn't, you know, you know, a lot of people get worried that when they hear a coyote yelling, that means it's, it's attacking something or it's chasing something. Usually it's just communicating where it is, either to its family members or to uh, coyotes outside its family. Coyote is doing well because it does favor edge habitat. You know, over the years, this coyote was known as an open range animal. It thrived in the Dakotas where it was just open plains. And then at, when the wolf was removed from many of these states, when the wolf was extirpated, that allowed the coyote to spread because the wolf was the coyote's main competitor. Without the wolf, the coyote could just spread across the United States and pretty much the coyote is in every state of the United States, including Massachusetts. And in Massachusetts, coyotes are in every single county and they're in every single town in Massachusetts. But again, they favor edge habitat and edge habitat is when you have you know, an open area, your, your yard, and you have shrubs around it. Because the coyote likes to be able to see everything, yet it likes to know that there's that shrubby habitat if it needs to find cover, or it can use that shrubby habitat to look for prey items. Um, it is omnivorous, which means it eats everything. It eats anything we like, such as our garbage. It likes, you know, small prey items, birds, mice, voles, insects, vegetables, berries, nuts. It eats everything, which is another reason it's done so well. It can take advantage of so many different food types that are available in suburban areas. Um, it is crepuscular, and that means it's most active at dawn and dusk. But we are seeing changes in behavior in response to them adapting to suburbia. You know, it used to be fairly rare for you to see a coyote during the daytime, and people worry that when they do see a coyote during the daytime, that means that coyote's unhealthy, something's gotta be wrong with it. But what we're seeing is coyotes, they're just you know, adapting to the change in the environment. They are taking advantage of the food supply, and so now, based off the food supply, they might be active more during the daytime. Um, we get reports, you know, when people put out their garbage, maybe in the middle of the day, the coyote keys into that and goes up to the garbage and goes after it. You know, we like to tell people just because you see a coyote during the day doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it. It's just responding to human activities. And lastly, I mentioned it has variable home ranges. So if you live in a town, if you live on one side of the town and you see a coyote, and then maybe a friend of yours that lives five miles away sees another coyote, 
They are probably part of the same pack. In fact, it could be the same animal. Again, they can have very huge home ranges. And so you could be seeing the same animal just traveling throughout its home range. Or you might just be seeing another coyote that's part of that family. And a typical family size is the parents and then the pups from that year. And we see anywhere from two coyotes to eight coyotes in a family. Again, the food habits, I've mentioned before, it, go, it pretty much eats everything, and unfortunately it does go after our cats. Again, it, it can't tell the difference, and it'll take advantage because the cat is a smaller size, and so it'll key into a cat as prey. Now, when we get you know, calls about coyote activity, you know, we do see it throughout the entire year, but our peak you know, calls come in January and March when it's breeding season, and that's because the coyotes, they're howling at each other, they're trying to impress the mate, they're trying to get the girl, so they're, they're being more vocal, they're moving a lot, around a lot more in order to find that mate, so they're be, probably going to be a lot more visible. The other time of year is July through August, and that's because the pups are weaned, they no longer need milk from their mom, and so the parents are now taking their young out and showing them how to hunt. So the young are now traveling around with the parents. The parents don't have to stay so tied to the den because the pups can follow them. So the family starts to travel a lot more. And again, the coyotes are teaching their young how to hunt. So they're going to be a lot more visible to people. Now, the other canid in Massachusetts that we get calls about, and they're close cousins to the coyotes, is the fox. And we do have two types of fox in Massachusetts, the gray fox and the red fox. And again, sometimes when people call in, they mistake a fox for a coyote. And you can see with the gray fox why that would happen. I mean, both a coyote and a gray fox can be gray. But the fox, of course, is, it's much smaller. You know, a coyote, again, is 30 to 40 pounds. A fox will be between 10 and 15 pounds. Much smaller, much closer to the ground. Um, also, the gray fox has like that black mark across its nose. Red fox is completely red, usually has a white tip on its tail, and it also has black stockings. So it looks like it's wearing hose or something on its legs. So that's how you tell the difference. And again, we're seeing fox having adapted to suburbia. You know, here's someone's pool with a fox behind it. And probably that fox has a den site right behind the pool. And that's what we're seeing is not only is the fox keying in on food we leave out for it by accident or on purpose, but it's using our homes and our yards as den sites. And what we see is gray and red foxes, they will make their own dens. They'll make burrows in the ground, or they'll take advantage of existing excavations, you know, and make their dens there. But they'll just as easily take advantage of a crawl space underneath someone's house to set up their den. And those are two fox kicks peeking out underneath someone's house. They're fairly small. But that's what we're seeing more now is foxes really keying into those crawl spaces and taking advantage of the protection that they provide, the protection and warmth. Pretty much all these animals I've talked about, from the large mammals such as the bear and the deer, to the possums, the raccoons, coyotes, foxes, they're all doing well in the suburban environment. In closing, we'd like to thank Colleen and the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife for their help in familiarizing us with some of Newton's new arrivals. In our next session, Colleen will discuss further how one can help these animals to live their lives among us with mutual respect for our needs and theirs. Meanwhile, please visit our website at www.newtonconservators.org. Till next time, this is Chris Cristiello for the Environmental Show and the Newton Conservators. Thank you.